All right, we will we'll move on to the next to the next area. And again, um, if you're if you're all kind of wondering, well, where where is all this leading? What we're doing here so far? Well, it's leading to the fact that we've been somewhere, we've learned a few things. Some of them good, some of them not so good. We've done some things, some of them good, some of them not so good. And we're still we're still fighting with this problem, and we still have to change what we're doing. So. <coughs> Hopefully some of the things that we're learning here today we're going to take forward and, and implement them. Um, and like I said, some of the things that we're, we're about to learn about, hopefully, you know, are, are going to be implemented long term. Um, one of those people that's one of our local local gurus who, likes, who, who spends lots of time working on this, Dr. Scott Knapper. Um, any of you who've been associated with our association for a few years knows that uh, uh, Dr. Knapper has been very closely tied to the development process on, on vaccines for CWD. Um, he is also currently working on some live testing methods and with that I will turn the microphone over to him and let him tell us what's hopefully new and current. Well, thank you, Harvey, for the invitation to be here. Um, when Harvey asked me to show up somewhere, I knew it because, frankly, I'm a little bit scared of him. <laughs> it's, um, it's good to be here. It's always nice to have a chance to talk to a, a captive audience. Most of my time is spent lecturing introductory biochemistry to, to very reluctant students. So it's nice to see we have the opportunity here. We can actually turn off the lights and people will stay in the room. Um, so my talk is very much going to build on what Harvey was saying, you know, what's been happening, some of it good and some of it not so good. That I want to give you an overview of what we've been doing in terms of vaccine development over the past 10 years and much more recently in terms of the live diagnostic test. And again, this is about creating tools for you guys. This is about creating opportunities. This is making it so we have better opportunities in the future to control the disease, uh, more opportunities than we have right now. So I want to start this out. Um, we're going to have to go to, to a little bit of the, the molecular details of it, because this is going to be important um, for both aspects of my talk. So the idea that the prion diseases represent this entirely new paradigm of infectious disease, the idea that we have this protein that's present on this PRPC in this normal healthy form, and that it's the misfolding of that protein into this alternate conformation that's associated with the disease. The idea that when this protein misfolds, it takes on these new characteristics. So one in that it's pathological, and the other is that it's infectious or that it's self-propagating. So again, the idea that this isn't your traditional infectious disease where there's this clearly defined boundary between you and what's ever attacking you. This isn't like a virus. This isn't like uh, a bacteria. This is a part of your body that's, that's turned against you, and that really complicates how we're going to be able to, to develop diagnostics as well as how we're going to develop treatments for the disease. The other thing I want to mention, that for the longest time when we think about the idea of an infectious protein, that that would be extremely limited to the realm of prion diseases, that that was really their defining characteristic. But one of the things we're seeing now is that this mechanism of infectious proteins doesn't seem to be limited exclusively to the prion diseases. And what's amazing is that some of the most common and important diseases of our time now seem to share a similar mechanism based on the misfolding of a self protein and the ability for these misfolded forms to have this infectious characteristic. Now I say infectious in the sense that they're self-propagating, not to say that if somebody with Alzheimer's sneezes on you, you're going to catch Alzheimer's, but the idea that these proteins can self-propagate themselves. Now as a protein biochemist, to me this is absolutely fascinating. The idea that this, this really miraculous property of self-propagation is being seen in all of these other proteins but this has some important implications for us as well. So both in the terms of the ability or the opportunity to take the research that we're doing and hopefully apply some of our findings to some of these really critical diseases, but also the opportunity to learn from the efforts um, for researchers who have been studying these diseases. So when you look at the diseases we have up on the screen here, that there has been an army of some of the best scientists in the world trying to tackle these problems for a very long time. So there's a tremendous amount of information. Now we can look at these diseases from this different perspective. What can we do with that? Can that inform us in our efforts to develop prion vaccines? So certainly the opportunity, but there also has to be the reality associated with it, that when we start to look at these diseases and all of the efforts that have gone forward into developing treatments and vaccines, that so far we haven't had anything successful. 
So the idea that we can't underestimate the magnitude of the challenge that's in front of us, that this isn't going to be a, a matter of quickly developing a vaccine and, and getting it into circulation. The, the, the biology of this problem is, is simply too great. Having said that, uh, a bit more optimistically, that when we talk about dealing with infectious diseases, um, I think it's fair to say that vaccines have been our most effective tool for controlling infectious diseases within humans and within livestock. And I think there's the opportunity to do something very similar within the prion diseases. But again, we have to appreciate that the, one of the caveats of vaccines is they're very effective when they work, but they're not always easy to develop. And that what we often see with new infectious diseases that either a vaccine will be developed very, very quickly that we can take sort of the, the standard approaches of inactivating a pathogen and coming up with a vaccine with using sort of 100-year-old technology or they're much more resistant to that efforts. And certainly a number of infectious diseases where we've never been able to come up with vaccines. So trying to figure it out that although a vaccine I think would be sort of the ultimate tool um, in, in being able to manage these types of diseases that we can't underestimate the magnitude of the challenge in getting there. So there's been quite a few efforts by different research groups to develop vaccines for the prion diseases, targeting different regions of the protein, utilizing different um, strategies of formulation and delivery, and there's been a number of success stories. Now, in large part, those are sort of academic successes. So we see sort of this proof of principle evidence that these various vaccines can either delay the onset of symptoms, they can prolong the lifespan of animals, so again, encouraging results that it can be done, but there, certainly there hasn't been sort of a home run yet, that we haven't seen something that clearly stands out as this is what the next, this is what a prion vaccine will look like. And I think we're at a point now where you know, these efforts have been going on long enough that it's time to sort of take a step back and say, well, where are we and what does this actually look like? And in my mind, there's sort of two key questions that, that need to be addressed. So one is, one of the things I always challenge my students with, what does success look like? You've got to know what the goal looks like. Now, if you're talking about a traditional vaccine, um, ideally you want something where the host is going to be completely protected from infection. And when we look at most of the vaccine development efforts for prion diseases so far, that's been sort of the, the standard that they've been holding these things to, is that can we find a way to completely protect animals from infection? Um, frankly, I don't think that's a very realistic goal at this point. The other vaccines, uh, how they measure the effects and, and how we sort of compare our progress across groups is, well, how long can we prolong the lifespan of the animals once they've been infected? And again, is that necessarily the best metric of success when we're talking about a vaccine for prion diseases? That certainly if we were talking about a human application where somebody had come down with a prion disease and you were able to expand sort of the the, the remainder of their life, or certainly the enjoyable part of the remainder of their life, uh, by tenfold, that would be considered a huge success. <coughs> if we talk about this in the context of animals, and in particular wildlife animals, that taking an animal who's infected with CWD and having a vaccine that keeps them around for longer isn't necessarily what you want, and in all likelihood, that's actually going to be counterproductive. That's all the more time for that animal to be out in the environment spreading more and more prions. Um, so it becomes very important to define what success looks like. And one of the things how we're shifting our perspective on this is that this isn't about protecting individual animals, this is about protecting populations of animals. And the, the metric we're considering now is if we can influence the, the amount of prions that are generated and shed by an animal, that's likely going to be more important than anything we can do in terms of the, the lifespan of the animal. So again, looking at this from a different measure of success. The, the other thing to consider that, you know, again, we have these, in the simplest form, we have these two different forms of the protein. You have the healthy form and the unhealthy form. Now, a lot of the vaccine development efforts so far haven't made an attempt to discriminate the two. So they're, they're making efforts just to get an immune response against whichever form of the protein to hopefully influence the, the progression of disease. Now, one of the concerns has always been that if you're inducing antibody responses against a widely expressed healthy form of the protein, could there potentially be uh, negative consequences to the host? So could you take an otherwise healthy animal and through the induction of antibodies to PRPC, induce responses that are going to be to the detriment of the health of the animal? Um, so the, the, the foundation of how I got into this was based on the assumption that you don't want to do that, that you want to be able to induce immune responses that are specific to the misfolded form. 
as you get sort of mature and ingrained in these disciplines, you start to realize that you know, quite often it's not sort of this black and white argument, that we're starting to see evidence where responses against PRPC seem to be okay for the host, that there aren't any negative consequences to it. And some of the evidence I'll show today where responses that are specific to the misfolded form can actually have detrimental consequences. So a lot of how we're reevaluating what we're doing is from the perspective of generation of these platforms that will enable us to look at different targets so we don't necessarily have to limit ourselves to the idea of this confirmation-specific immunotherapy. So what do we mean by that? So because the mechanism of this disease is just the, the misfolding of a protein, so we're not changing the, the sequence, we're not changing the amino acid composition, we're just changing what it looks like in terms of its three-dimensional presentation. So the idea that when this protein misfolds, it's going to expose regions for antibody binding that would otherwise be buried in the healthy form of the protein. So in the simplest example, I don't know if you guys can see me, that if we imagine the healthy form of the protein looks like this, where you've got your thumb tucked away within your fist, and then the unhealthy form of the protein looks like this, where your thumb is exposed, an obvious target for vaccine development would be to go against the thumb. That ideally what that's going to allow you to do is to induce antibody responses that are going to be specific to the misfolded, unhealthy form of the protein. And we call these targets disease-specific epitopes. So the rationale of this is that when you think about in an infected animal, that within that animal you're going to have a mixture of both the healthy as well as the unhealthy form of the protein. And the idea that you want to leave that healthy form of the protein alone so it can maintain doing whatever its normal biological function it is, and that you can specifically be going against the bad guy in the situation, that you can be going against the misfolded protein. So from our perspective, this was a safer approach, but also a more efficient approach, that you were targeting those antibodies specifically to the players that were responsible for the disease. So we're working with a fellow by the name of Neil Cashman out of the, the University of British Columbia. And he had identified three of these disease-specific epitopes for the prion protein. So three of these regions that are specifically exposed upon this folding that were presenting what seemed to be these ideal vaccine targets. Now the challenge was is that in terms of how do you take those targets and translate those into a real-world vaccine, that there's a number of challenges associated with this. So one, the, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that the prion protein is a self-protein. And your immune system goes to considerable efforts to make sure you don't develop immune responses against self-proteins. That normally you would associate that with, with things like lupus, with rheumatoid arthritis, with these autoimmune disorders. So your body goes to great lengths to make sure you don't induce immune responses against your own proteins. So that right away, in terms of developing a prion vaccine, that's one of the obstacles you have to come. Now you make that even more difficult when you say, well, I'm not even going to be working with the entire protein. I'm just going to be working with these very small regions of the protein. That getting strong immune responses against those very small targets is even more difficult to do. So it's a challenge layered upon a challenge. And he had tried for quite some time to, to translate these targets into, into vaccines where you could get immune responses against these targets, and he was unsuccessful. So he approached us at Vito, that would be about 12 years ago now, um, see if we could help. But obviously, um, at, at the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, we have a number of different platforms available for the, for the generation of vaccines. And one we had that seemed uh, particularly appropriate for, for this challenge was a protein called leukotoxin. That previously we had demonstrated that you can take this leukotoxin protein and you can fuse um, peptides from self proteins to it in order to get strong immune responses against it. So you could overcome this self tolerance. So this had been developed in the context of developing a vaccine for GnRH, so that you could um, immunocastrate animals by raising immune responses against GnRH. So in terms of the, the features that made this protein very attractive, that it was demonstrated you could use this against self proteins, like Neil was talking about here, that you can produce this in E. coli, so it's very cheap. So in terms of developing a, an actual vaccine that could go into application, it was consistent with that. And this had already been licensed for use um, in livestock animals. So in terms of all of the, the barriers that sometimes separate academic science from real world applications, this seemed to be a great way to go. And so our initial efforts were to take these targets identified by Neil, put them onto this leukotoxin protein, and put them into animals. Well, it didn't work. That even in the, the use of this really strong carrier protein with demonstrated efficacy and similar problems, it didn't work. And sort of this has been the story of this project of 
you know, not getting a ribbon tied around your nuts, but getting kicked in the nuts over and over. <laughs> so we had to work on that. My background is in protein crystallography, which means using things like the synchrotron to figure out exactly what proteins look like. Um, so some of our early applications were how can we expand these different targets in order to make them more immunogenic so we can get stronger immune responses. Um, so we took that type of approach and we also took a, a computer science type of approach. So we developed a software platform that what we can do is we can now provide it with um, your specific target of your protein of interest. It automatically goes through, it creates rational expansions in both directions along the chain and it anticipates um, whether or not those are going to induce a strong immune response. So in terms of we faced an obstacle, we overcame the obstacle, and in doing so, we've created a tool that's now being used in the development of vaccines for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Um, so we're, we're pretty proud that that was developed. We were able to apply that to all three of Neil's epitopes, and we were able to generate vaccines that induce immune responses against those targets. So by rational expansion of those targets, we now have something where we can fuse those peptides onto leukotoxin and get epitope-specific immune responses in a number of species that would be of priority. So this isn't just in mice, we were able to do this in sheep, in cattle, in elk, in deer. Um, so we were quite encouraged by that. One of the concerns was is that as you expand these targets, are you going to lose this specificity? That again, the, the whole philosophy of our approach was to induce immune responses that are specific for the misfolded form. And what we saw was that we, we retained that specificity. So this is looking at the ability of the antibodies induced by each of those vaccines to, inter, to interact with the, the prion protein from either a healthy brain and they don't interact with anything, whereas from a prion infected brain, they do. So even with these expanded epitopes, we still have the specificity that we want. We were able to show that we could co-formulate these into a multivalent vaccine. So rather than going just a, a single target, could you bring all of these things together that you have a single vaccine so you're getting immune responses to each part? And again, the idea that when we, when we say it's just misfolded, properly folded, that, that's probably a dangerous oversimplification that we now appreciate. There's all of these different um, subspecies of the prions that have slightly different characteristics. And we have to think about these, and I think we have to treat these more like a, a living agent than just a misfolded protein. So no different than you think about a bacteria or a virus can, can evolve away from different treatments that you're developing, the idea that perhaps this can as well. That the more targets we go after at the same time, the better opportunity we have to, to be able to nail this down. And we were able to show that we could co-formulate this as a multivalent vaccine, still get strong immune responses, and again, we don't lose any of the specificity associated with this. So another big success. One of the, the questions that always sort of dogged this project, that if you're inducing antibodies that are specific for the misfolded form of the protein, might there be the opportunity for those antibodies to either promote or accelerate disease? That one of the things we have to be aware of it, with proteins is that their structures are somewhat dynamic. So it's been described as breathing. They can adopt sort of different conformations. So you can imagine when we thought about this properly folded form as the thumb is buried away on the inside, that it's not going to be locked into that rigid structure. There's going to be a certain amount of flexibility associated with it. And the idea that if you have an antibody present that's just waiting to grab that thumb, that perhaps it could be grabbing it and actually promoting formation of the misfolded species. So one of the concerns we have right from the start is that you could actually promote the onset of disease with this. Um, to address this, we took vaccines generated through these, uh, the antibodies induced by the vaccines, we were able to show that we could mix them with brain homogenous, and despite our best efforts to, for this to cause misfolding, it didn't. So this would suggest that these antibodies cannot take the healthy form of the protein and push it towards the misfolding conformation. So again, good news there. We also wanted to look at that in, in a more complicated biological context. You always have to be very careful of how far you can extrapolate the results you're getting from test tube experiments. So what we did is we took transgenic mice that overexpressed the prion protein. Now these mice are quite often used by researchers is that they have a very high susceptibility to prion disease. So because of it, normally there's the very long latency period of the disease and in terms of scientific experiments, quite prohibitive. So they've created these um, genetically engineered mice that are predisposed to prion disease 
so that it's easier to infect them and the disease progresses faster. It's also known that these animals, if you leave them long enough, will just spontaneously develop prion disease. So they're essentially these little sort of ticking time bombs that if you just look at them funny, they have the potential to develop these diseases. So what we wanted to do was to say, well, if these vaccines have the potential to promote disease, if you're ever going to see that in an animal model, it's likely going to be within these transgenic mice. We were able to show that we could vaccinate these mice, we could leave them for very long periods of time, we left these guys up to a year, and we weren't generating um, any of the misfolded forms. So again, suggesting that these antibodies within the context of a healthy animal who hasn't been exposed to infectious prions, this isn't promoting disease. And if I seem to be putting a lot of emphasis on that, that's what's called foreshadowing. <laughs> what we also wanted to see, can these antibodies neutralize prions? Can they help to, to get rid of some of the infectious agent? Uh, again, because of the, the animal trials are very expensive and very time consuming to do, we initially did this through a tissue culture model where you can monitor the ability of different treatments to be able to, to neutralize prions. And what we were able to show is that antibodies against all of these epitopes um, as both purified antibodies where you can neutralize prions, but also just taking the serum from immunized animals. So again, when you look at them at pre-immunization or before there's the opportunity to induce a strong antibody response, that serum doesn't um, neutralize prions. Whereas in the time frames it takes to induce these antibodies, now we, start, we, are, we have the ability to neutralize it. So again, that's not in vivo yet, that's not within the context of an animal, but that is saying in these complex biological mixtures that these antibodies that we're raising have the ability to neutralize the infectious agent. So quite encouraging. So far, everything I've been talking about with the, the leukotoxin protein and all these platforms was developed within the context of injected vaccines, sort of the, the traditional route of vaccine delivery. So something that might be of utility in terms of farmed animals, but in terms of a tool to be able to, to control chronic wasting disease in the wild, obviously you're not going to have the opportunity to be running around injecting every animal. But what we would have to be able to do is to translate these strategies into vaccination strategies that are consistent with a wildlife vaccine. Now fortunately there's been uh, a lot of sort of paths in the snow to follow. Um, in particular, if you look at rabies, there's an oral vaccine for rabies that's been utilized for, for long periods of time within Europe, within um, Eastern Canada, very successful. So the idea that you can create these vaccines, you can release them out into the wild, the animals will consume them and self-vaccinate. So we thought if we're gonna tackle chronic wasting disease in the wild, we have to look at some of these formats. So the, the leukotoxin protein we had initially been working with wasn't compatible with the types of biological vectors that we would need um, in terms of a wildlife vaccine. So instead of what we're doing here, um, you know, we see it as a path in the snow, we thought, well, let's have a look at this rabies, the oral rabies vaccine, that can we build upon that infrastructure that's already in place. And with the oral rabies vaccine, the, the protective protein or the, the protective antigen is this rabies glycoprotein. And it's really, it's an amazing vaccine that once you've been vaccinated against this, you maintain very high, very protective responses for long, long periods of time. So it's known that this induces very strong immune responses. So the idea was, can we essentially take the, the vaccine that's already been created, can we take our little prion epitopes and just attach this on to the rabies glycoprotein so you have sort of this hybrid, um, a, a rabies prion vaccine all sort of packaged into one. And this went better than we would have expected. That taking the same epitopes and taking the same target and putting it either with the leukotoxin protein or the rabies glycoprotein that what we saw was is that we got much stronger immune responses when we took those targets in the context of the rabies glycoprotein. So one of the things to appreciate here that this represents a log scale. So the differences we're seeing there correspond to antibody responses that are two orders of magnitude better using the rabies glycoprotein. So meaning that you have 100 times better immune responses using this other carrier. We were just hoping for something equivalent, so this was very encouraging. The other nice thing we saw was is that you didn't need multiple immunizations in order to get these strong and sustained responses. That with a single immunization, we were able to get these very strong and sustained responses. Where in contrast with a single immunization with the um, leukotoxin protein, that those responses fade out quite quickly. And typically we think of titers of, uh, of around 1,000 as being sort of the threshold between a responder and a non-responder. 
So with the rabies glycoprotein within for a matter of weeks, you're crossing below that threshold, whereas using this TGG, that with the single immunization, you get these very high responses, and we follow this up to a year out, still really good responses. So again, the animal would only have to consume this once in order for this to work. We were able to show that we could take uh, a target species. So we were able to take white-tailed deer, give them this oral vaccine that we just fed this to them, and we were able to get both systemic, so responses within the serum, as well as mucosal immune responses. So at the sort of the, the lining within the gut that we could develop these responses as well. You know, so very encouraging result there. We were able to show in terms of the safety profile of this that anytime you're releasing a vaccine into the wild, you want to make sure of the, the safety of it, that there's likely going to be other animals that are going to be exposed to this. So one of the things you want to make sure of is that you don't have prolonged shedding of the vaccine. Again, working with white-tailed deer, we were able to show that you only see the virus coming out in the feces sort of as it's chased through the system, but it's not replicating within these animals. That the vector we use doesn't have the ability to, to, to replicate itself to the extent that you're going to be seeing this showing up. So in terms of a safety profile, this is exactly what you would want to see. So starting moving into challenge trials, does this actually work? So one of the first models we looked at was a sheep model of scrapie. So how this model works is you vaccinate the, the pregnant mothers, and then right after the, the lambs are born, they're orally challenged with scrapie material. Again, sort of consistent with the idea we think animals are, are most susceptible while they're young, so they get this oral dose of scraping material, and then they're allowed to suckle from their mothers. So the lambs born of vaccinated mothers will get the, the passive transfer of, of antibodies from the mom. And what we were able to show in this model is that the lambs born of the vaccinated mothers survived longer than the lambs born of the unvaccinated mothers. And this was statistically significant protection. So that was great news for us, very encouraging. Uh, a few sort of notes about this. This was only done with a small number of animals, and this was a very aggressive model of disease, that we put a lot of scraping material down the throats of these young animals. So the, the time frames that you're seeing uh, these animals succumb to disease is much, much faster than what you're going to see with natural scraping. So the idea that our vaccine was able to have any type of impact um, in this very aggressive model of disease was very encouraging. Also important to note that this was done with one of our earliest generations of vaccines that induces immune responses that are only a fraction of what we see with sort of our, our current, our fourth generation vaccines. So a lot of reasons to be optimistic, which is usually when something goes wrong. So the next trial we did, we wanted to look at the ability of the vaccines to be able to protect elk from a, a more natural model of infection. So how this was going to be done is that we would have a group of both vaccinated as well as unvaccinated animals having um, both, or both susceptibilities, high and moderate susceptibility to CWD, and then put these onto um, CWD infected land. So again, much closer to a natural model of infection. And here we were again just measuring success from the perspective of the ability to either protect these animals from disease, or if they did get infected, hopefully at least keeps them alive longer. That is not what we saw. So what we saw for both of the, the susceptible and the lower susceptibility animals, that when we compared our vaccinates to the controls, and this was looking at rectal biopsies, that we were seeing faster onset of disease within the vaccinated animals. So that was showing up at 20 months as well as 30 months post-challenge. And when we look at the survival rates of these animals, we see exactly the same thing, that our vaccinated animals do worse. So this vaccine seemed to accelerate the disease. So the, the big question is why? Now it's important to note the result that we're seeing with these elk represents the same vaccine that went into the sheep trial that we saw. So the obvious question is, well, what's the difference between the two? And what I think this comes down to is that they're, they're very different models of disease. So the idea with the sheep is they got this single exposure to the infectious material. We fed them two of them once, and that was it. Whereas with these elk who were being housed on this contaminated land had this continual ongoing exposure to prions. 
So my personal opinion in terms of what's going on, so we, we know that the antibodies alone can't induce misfolding of the protein. So I don't think what we're seeing here is taking this vaccine, taking healthy animals who aren't exposed to prions and giving them CWD. I don't think that's the case at all. We also know that within the context of um, both the transgenic mice and another experiment I didn't mention where we took sheep, we vaccinated, vaccinated them, we kept them alive for three years and they showed no signs of prion disease. So I don't think it's that the antibodies are promoting misfolding. I think what these antibodies are doing is promoting uptake of prions from the gut. So again, these antibodies are going to be present at the mucosal surfaces within the digestive tract. And because these animals are on infected land where you have this continual amount of infectious material passing through them, that this is essentially stopping up the prions from the environment, um, accelerating disease within these animals. So obviously not what we wanted to see. To put this into a bit of perspective though, that to take a step back from this, we said this mechanism of approaching misfolding has been observed in a number of these different diseases. And for these different diseases, a lot of groups are doing vaccine development efforts sort of mimicking what we're doing is, is trying to target epitopes associated with the misfolding protein. And what people are seeing for those vaccines against those proteins in those other diseases is the same thing. That for some of these targets, the vaccines actually make it worse. So there was a vaccine being developed for, for ALS against the SOG protein. That again, some of the epitopes, it makes things worse. Against other epitopes, it actually makes things better. So we have to be able to, to consider and evaluate these things on a case-by-case -case and target-by-target -target basis. So again, we initially had this idea that you need to go specifically against the misfolded protein. Again, I don't think it's that simple. That, that's not to say that all of the um, vaccines against these disease-specific epitopes are necessarily going to have this outcome, but the idea being that that's a possibility. Um, again, the nice thing that because we're talking about platform technologies, we now have the opportunity to put other epitopes in. Oh, the colors didn't show up here, but you know, to sort of emphasize where we are and you know what I view as the successes and what I view as the challenges. That in terms of being able to take these different targets um, as univalent vaccines, as individuals, we had a number of different challenges we had to overcome to get to the point of getting to a vaccine. Only one of these has been tested within animal models. Um, you know, we had one trial that said it was good, the other one said it was bad. I, I'm placing more emphasis on the results that said the vaccine was bad, because to me that was a much more realistic model of infection. So to me, this one is sort of a non-starter. This isn't something we're, we're going to be looking at in the future. But the idea that we also have these other epitopes, that the, the vaccines are created, the bullet is in the chamber, we need to see if those ones are going to work. We also have those present as a multivalent vaccine and for this rigid loop, we've also got that created as a rigid loop. So something else I want to mention, we talk about you know, developing this pipeline, developing these platforms, that one of the other diseases my group is going for is, is ALS, that we're trying to develop vaccines for that based upon epitopes that are specifically exposed on a misfolded protein. Same damn scenario we see here that we've been able to take those into most models of ALS, and we've been able to show that for both of those vaccines, we're able to delay the onset of symptoms of ALS in these mouse models, that the, mouse, the, the mice stay healthier for longer, that we're able to, to reduce some of the symptoms of disease. Again, one of the big things we see with ALS is this, this loss of coordination. So one of the ways we can quantify this, if you think of the the lumberjack Olympics where they go on the log in the river and who can stay on there the longest. That's what we do with these mice is they put them on a spinning rod to see who can stay out there the longest. And what we're able to show is that the mice who are receiving our ALS vaccine actually do better. So in terms of the overall approach of is it possible to develop a vaccine by targeting misfolded epitopes, um, yes, I think there is reason to be optimistic. And again, I want to be a little bit careful. I don't want anybody walking away from here saying, well, the prion vaccine didn't work, but they've cured ALS. That's not what I'm saying. That for ALS, that we've got some proof of principal evidence that we could move in that direction, that there is encouraging evidence. So the next big step for us is to, to be able to test these vaccines. Um, and in particular, to me, I'm not that interested in testing these in the more sort of artificial models of infection. That again, I think it, we could sort of tilt it in our favor um, put these into sort of comparable models that we did with the sheep, 
and, and show a protective response, but that's not going to translate into a real world scenario. But how we need to test these, in my opinion, is very similar to, to what we did in Wyoming, where we put these into the target species and we look at this environmental exposure to prions. So the other thing we're trying to do to, to sort of complement this is the idea of developing live diagnostic <coughs> tests for, for prions or for CWD. So again, the idea that, that one of the challenges associated with the disease from a management perspective is that you have this very long latency period. So you have these long periods of time where the animals look perfectly healthy, but they're, they're generating and shedding prions into the environment, um, compromising the, the health and safety of, of the rest of the herd. So the idea that if you were able to identify those animals before they were showing symptoms with a live diagnostic test, that this could be a very effective management tool. So as was um, alluded to this morning, one of the techniques we're working with is PMCA. And specifically what we want to be to, what we're doing is looking at the detection of prions within fecal samples. So can we look at a fecal sample of an apparently healthy animal and determine its CWD status? So we're working with CFAA on this and they're providing us fecal samples um, from animals from herds that are undergoing scheduled depopulation. So to us, this is sort of the, the, the perfect samples to be looking at. That in terms of a real world application, you could see that you know, these animals who, who appear healthy, for us to be able to take this approach and determine their status, their infection status by this and then compare it to the results that they're getting by traditional analysis, I think will be very encouraging in terms of being able to determine both the specificity as well as the sensitivity of these tests. So in terms of being able to correctly identify all of the CWD positive animals, but also to make sure that we're not getting false negatives. That one of the challenges of these types of, of, of amplification approach, that there is the opportunity that you're just going to spontaneously generate the misfolded species, um, giving a positive result for what is an uninfected animal. So it's gonna be quite interesting as we go through and start looking at these fecal samples and start comparing the results we get through this type of approach versus the, the traditional types of assays that are being done. The, the funding has been in place for this project for over a year, but unfortunately um, this has been held up by, by legal issues um, just in terms of transfers of samples um, from CFIA. But I, I'm happy to say with the, the strong efforts from our partners at CFIA that as of two weeks ago we got a great big bag of poop, so we, we started these experiments. Um, so we're very excited to see what we see there experience in working with PMCA. And so one of the things I can show is that we've optimized these assays so that if we look at the feces of a number of pre-challenged animals, we don't see anything coming up. And so these are animals that were orally challenged um, with CWD, that after six months you start seeing some of these animals coming up positive. And again, these animals were completely asymptomatic. They, they look perfectly healthy. And after nine months you see virtually all of those animals coming up sort of speaking to the ability of this test um, to be able to detect prions within the feces. So quite encouraged that this will represent, you know, again, another tool um, to hopefully help the industry. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. somewhat critical of the vaccine research, and I'm glad that you were very open about that. I, I, I agree with you that, um, you know, the antibody response isn't always a good thing um, for this disease, for a number of other diseases, so I'm glad that, that you were open and honest about that. And, um, <laughs> I must say I was blissfully naive from when I entered into this project 12 years ago. Um, if I sort of had a crystal ball at that time, <laughs> sort of this is what this is going to look like. Yeah, I don't know if I would have been quite as enthusiastic, but we're getting promising results, but yeah, pretty much every step of the way, it's been another obstacle to overcome. Okay, is everybody awake? <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't put all the On the fecal yeah, sample. You bust out the question. You have a question for everybody. <laughs> On the fecal sample uh, test, any idea of what kind of real world cost, if it ever came to be used? Hardly put my feet to the fire about that. What was the number I gave you? Um, I think it was just under a hundred dollars, you know, 
right now, but I, I, I think once we, do you have that? No. Um, yeah, at, at the moment, it's not likely going to be sort of cost effective for, for screening herds, but you know, when we talk about the... This, sorry, just to put it in perspective, you know, we, we think about, you're playing to talk about it, you know, $100 is a lot, but we, okay, for example, our, our diagnostics on our on our samples that we're sending in now, uh, and Betty, you could probably back me up on this, the real cost is what, about $125? 120. 120, real cost? Okay, so, you know, it's... Well, here's, here's a real world situation where I think, I don't think there's anyone that can deny after what we're talking about here that if we're going to continue on raising captive elk, the economic realities are there. There's markets for all three of the products. We're going to have to learn how to live with this disease. The population is not working. It's a huge drain on the taxpayer and, and the resources of the CFIA and everybody else involved. It, it creates boundaries and borders that we don't need. And the only way to get through this, I think, is one of the main components that we're missing is a live animal test that's recognizable and approved. If, and the ease of it is what's key. Fecal, fecal sample is the easiest. It's also at the point of shedding. Right? Sure. Yeah. So if I'm going to sell taking it way down the road, if I'm going to sell a velvet from a positive herd, right, I velvet that animal and at the same time I draw a fecal sample and I have it tested before that antler that that is released, $100, $50 being better, but $100, $100 on a $1,000 to $2,000 antler harvest isn't the end of the world. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything you say. Um, just to sort of put an asterisk on this, that if you did get a negative result, isn't necessarily to say that the animal doesn't have the disease. Um, it may be in the very early stages of it. So I guess it would be no different than, you know, a pregnancy test. You're able to say, well, I understand, but at this point, there isn't any organization responsible for the safety of food in North America requiring testing of an elk before it enters the food chain. Well, yeah. just further to that, what are we doing right now? I mean, we have animals walking around that are untested. And we're harvesting the antler and selling it because there's no evidence of, of the presence of disease. So really, uh, if we can go to this live test, that even if it's only 77% better, we're 77% ahead of where we are right now. Exactly. I'll agree, yeah. Completely agree. I think it's valuable information to have. Scott, you said in a 2015 paper, uh, you said in a 2015 paper here that you're studying the literature. Are <laughs> <laughs> you student of mine? Yeah, it was last year. Oh. <laughs> that was a chance for revenge. <laughs> This, this isn't going to get you a better pay. <laughs> but you said that uh, the vaccines targeting multiple BSCs uh, didn't seem to help. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, seemed to have less of an effect if it was targeting multiple ones rather than one. But you said that you've moved ahead, you have vaccines ready to be tested with multiple ones. Did something change that make it seem more likely? Or? So is that the um, antibody neutralization paper? Uh, yeah. Okay. So in the in vitro assays, it didn't seem to matter if you're going against one or three, but some of the evidence we have now that when we're using serum from vaccinated animals, that the, the multivalent is better. Oh, cool. Good question. Right. On topic. Ian, Ian, are you waving or drowning? No, no, I'm just giving the young man a point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay.